I'd just like to start. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to also acknowledge, acknowledge uh, uh, the presence of the uh, Eckstein family who helped make this, uh, make this event possible. Uh, also, I want to recognize uh, Dr. Carson Phillips, Assistant Director of the New River Holocaust Center. Uh, we're, we're very happy to have him uh, with us as well. Um, so, I'd like to spend a few minutes, just a few short minutes, introducing our speaker, uh, Professor Waitman Bourne. Uh, who serves as a Lewis and Francis Blumkin Professor of Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the University of Nebraska. Uh, has worked for years and years and years uh, in a lot of different areas involving um, uh, the research of uh, World War II and specifically the Holocaust, um, in different venues of education, educating uh, the public. Um, uh, he received his PhD from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, for the past uh, seven years, uh, he's instructed cadets from the U.S. Service Academies in ethical military decision-making uh, and in the American Service Academy program. He works as a consultant uh, for the United States Holocaust Memor Memorial Museum. Um, and uh, the fact that he advises uh, um, and, and gives courses and lectures in uh, military academies is not a coincidence. Uh, he's a graduate of the United States uh, Military Academy of West Point himself. He served as a tank platoon leader, uh, um, deployed in Iraq in 2003 as a scout platoon leader, and uh, later as an assistant squadron operations officer. Uh, he's authored books and many, many, many articles. Um, and uh, with no further ado, uh, we're very much looking forward to hear uh, Professor uh, Bourne. Please. Hopefully, 
knock on wood, uh, most of us will not be put in a situation of being either a victim or a perpetrator of a genocide. Um, but that doesn't mean that we aren't placed in situations where we experience um, or are tempted to participate in experiencing discrimination against others, et cetera, et cetera, which I think is the real value in a lot of ways of, of teaching the Holocaust. So first let's talk about collaboration. Anybody want to take a stab at defining what collaboration means in terms of the Holocaust? Don't be scared. Yeah? Working together. Working together. Okay, good. So this is like the, the, the textbook definition, right? Collaboration is not always a bad thing, right? If you do a group project, uh, you're collaborating, right? Um, however, of course, in the context of the Holocaust, collaboration is taken on rightfully so sort of a much more um, negative connotation. Anybody have another idea for how you might define collaboration in the Holocaust? Yeah? People help the Germans um, commit genocide? Absolutely. Yeah, so, so collaboration in the context of the Holocaust very often means uh, individuals and organizations helping, uh, I usually say the Nazis because not all Germans um, are doing this, but certainly many are, but helping the Nazis or the Germans in carrying out various forms uh, and, and versions of the Holocaust, from um, closing down people's stores to actually killing people all the way across uh, sort of the gambit. So that's a really good definition. And we should also include, by the way, um, non-Germans, um, particularly because I study Eastern Europe, where without the participation of the local people who weren't Jewish, um, much of this wouldn't have been possible. Um, of course, one of the problems that we all confront with the context of uh, collaboration is where do we draw the line? You know, what, 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 is, what constitutes collaboration and then when do you sort of shift over into being a perpetrator, right? Um, or being an actual criminal? And um, I'm going to frustrate everyone by not answering that question. Um, because I think it's a very difficult one, and we can talk about that, which I think will be more useful. Um, there are lots of different ways that we can consider collaboration, different groups that we can consider as collaborators. Um, we have individuals, um, very often we have neighbors, um, but we also have organizations. So um, the German medical establishment, for example, um, was a collaborator in the eugenics program, which was a program to kill people who were mentally or physically handicapped. Right? Um, they got a lot out of this. They were doing it for a variety of different reasons, but many of them were to benefit themselves. They didn't necessarily come up with the program, but when it came up, they uh, took advantage of it um, to, to advance themselves. So um, why the German army? Right? Um, why should we talk about the German army? Well, I think there are a couple reasons um, that are important. Anybody have a guess how many German soldiers there were during the course of World War II? Yeah? 30, how many? 30, 40,000. Okay, he says 30, 40,000, but I see higher. Over a million? Over a million? Okay. This is an auction we're going up. How about 8 million? Okay. Fifteen million. That's we'll stop there. That's pretty close. Okay. Seventeen million. Okay. Seventeen million German men and, and not a few women um, were members of the German army during the Holocaust. Okay. And this is particularly important um, because here you have an entire swath of the population, a very large group of people. So we're not talking about the SS, for example. Um, which was a relatively small organization um, in this sense. We're talking about a large group of people who, in lots of different ways, um, become involved in the Holocaust. And as a result, I think that many of them are, are ordinary people, right? Um, many of, most of them were drafted, so they're not necessarily joining the German army because they have any particularly strong Nazi views. Excuse me, but many will or have, um, but most of them are just there because they have to be, right? So what we have then is a group of people put into a certain situation, and then we, we look at how they act, and how they respond to that situation. And remember what I said, 
everyone has a choice. Okay? And I'll come back to that um, in a little bit. But first I want to start um, with a story. Uh, because I think generally the most interesting parts of history begin with stories and begin with human beings and individuals, right? Um, it's very difficult to visualize six million people. It's very difficult to visualize 5,000 people, right? Um, but it's very easy to visualize one person. So I often say well, there's no such thing as the Holocaust. There are six million Holocausts, right? Everyone has their own journey. All the victims, all the survivors, and all the perpetrators have their own journey through this, through this event that we call the Holocaust. And by looking at those, I think we learn a lot more about human beings rather than sort of these large generalizations. So I'm going to start in the town of Slonim, which is located um, in Belarus now, but it was part of eastern Poland for most of its existence. Um, our story begins on uh, the morning of 14 November, 1941. And on this morning, um, a mother takes her children, her two daughters, Lisa and Pola, to the ghetto fence, because they were uh, confined in a ghetto, and tells them to flee, because she knows that there's an axion coming. An axion is a large roundup, right, um, where the Nazis are going to take a large number of Jews and murder them. And this mother makes a very difficult decision and says to her daughters, you need to flee, and basically separates herself from them and says, run away. And they do. Um, and here's a... So they have to keep running because they're sort of being called out everywhere they go. And they end up in the fields and the forests outside of Slonim, um, where they run across the killing site, where between eight and 10,000 um, Jews of Slonim are being murdered um, in the same day. So this is a massive, a massive killing operation. And as they're in the forest, and here's the uh, site, what it looks like today. I visited in 2009. Um, as they're there, a Polish forest ranger comes up to them and says, what are you doing here? And they try to tell him that they're getting wood for winter, but they don't, they don't convince him. And so he, he takes them and he puts them in line with all the rest of the Jews from Sloan who are marching out of town, um, being marched out of town, I should say, to this killing site. And at a certain point, um, Pola, who is the older, do older daughter, older sister, tells her sister, run. And they take off across this open field um, towards another set of woods. And in this particular instance, which is interesting and again shows sort of the complexity, um, German soldiers who are guarding this, this column don't shoot at them. Uh, the, the Polish forest ranger throws his axe at, at uh, Pola and actually hits her in the leg, so she's kind of wounded. But they both escape. And they collapse and they're exhausted and they're in a, in a barn um, owned by a Christian woman. And she comes out and she says, Don't tell me anything. I know where you're coming from, I know why you're here. She hides them in her sofa um, during this, act, this killing action. And then um, both girls sneak back into the ghetto because it wasn't really safe for them to remain outside because they were going to be turned in by, by somebody else. Um, the rest of the story later on is that Bola, unfortunately, is shot trying to escape the ghetto in 1942, but Lisa survives. And Lisa goes on to become the president of the... Um, Holocaust, uh, let's see if I get the name, name straight, of the Holocaust Memorial Foundation in Skokie, Illinois. And I don't know if you probably aren't familiar with it, but in, in the 80s, um, there was a big neo-Nazi movement in Skokie. And this spawned, um, in America, a great backlash from the Jewish community where um, they said, we need to educate people about this because we can't be having neo-Nazis on the ground. And every year, Lisa would go to the Chicago, to the Illinois Storytelling Festival. 
and would be part of the people telling their stories. She would tell her story. And in um, 2002, she actually dies on stage at this uh, storytelling, fest storytelling uh, festival, um, which, is, which is really sad. And her last words were, uh, please remember, remember this story, because I don't know how long I'm going to be around to tell it. And then she actually dies. So one of the reasons that I do what I do is to give a voice to people like Lisa um, and her family and everybody else, because I suspect it's true that most people um, don't know nearly as much about what's known as the Holocaust by bullets takes place in Eastern Europe um, long before Auschwitz opens up as a killing center or any of the places that you've probably heard a lot more about in your study of the Holocaust. Um, and of course I start with this story because the German army is deeply involved in this action and in making this action take place. So let me talk really quickly a little bit about uh, the Holocaust uh, in Eastern Europe in the context of a war of annihilation, okay? Um, <coughs> everyone, is everyone sort of familiar with the history of World War II, right? We have the Western Front and the Eastern Front, Germans versus Russians, and then the Americans come in very late in the war um, and land in France. Um, the war on the Eastern Front is fundamentally different <coughs> than any of the other fronts. For the Nazis, it's a war of annihilation, and they use this word themselves, right? So there's not going to be any peace treaty. There's no settlement. There's no sort of, okay, you got us. We're going to surrender. Um, it's a clash of cultures, in their view, the Nazi worldview. It's a clash of races, um, from which there can only be one survivor, okay? So it's complete annihilation. And you can see in some of these, some of these images here, that are, I think, particularly useful, right? Uh, uh, anybody know what's going on here? Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Um, it looks like that nothing stole some Jewish uh, animals. Yeah, so I, we don't know exactly who they belong to, but what we do see is German soldiers stealing pigs, right? Um, and, you know, it's kind of funny, right, because you have these soldiers with pigs on leashes, but if you consider how desperately poor the people of Eastern Europe were, um, this kind of loss and theft of property is actually a really devastating blow because for a certain family this may be all the food they have um, for the winter, right? Burning of village is also very bad uh, if you don't have any place to go when it's you know minus 80 degrees, etc. Um, so this is a, a really important thing I think to point out. Um, if we move on to talk a little bit about what's known as the Holocaust by bullets. Um, who's familiar with the Holocaust by bullets? Has anybody, has anybody heard this term before? Yeah. yeah, what is it? I guess it's like the German like war of annihilation. Like in, in Europe, like it was it's, it was different. Like they would shoot the Jews. So it was like the Einsatzgruppen. Absolutely, yeah. this is fantastic. So he mentions the Einsatzgruppen, right? And the Einsatzgruppen are these mobile killing squads, right? And their job is to go throughout Eastern Europe, predominantly. They start in Poland in 1939, but then they're sort of um, balked up and sent to uh, the Soviet Union. And their job is to go into every town and city and first and foremost annihilate, murder the communist functionaries, so the communist leadership of these towns, then the Jewish leadership and intelligentsia, so rabbis and other prominent members of the Jewish community, and then Jewish men of military age. Um, and then later on, this is going to change um, to everyone. But I wanted to point this out from the beginning. Um, because this Holocaust by bullets kills approximately one and a half million Jews before anybody is ever deported to Auschwitz, or to Sobibor, or to Dubrovnik, or any of these places that you've heard about. Which again, I think, how many people knew that? Okay, some. Good. Um, but a lot of people don't, right? And this continues on once these camps are open, once these extermination centers are open, people are still being shot. So my next project that I'm working on is um, a concentration camp outside of Lviv in Ukraine. 
And they, throughout the war, um, thousands of people continue to be shot in a valley just behind the camp. Right? This is a, a killing site uh, just outside the town of Nevergruda, where 5,000 um, Jews were murdered on December 10th, 1941. Um, and what's particularly striking about this place when you visit it is that this is exactly what it would have looked like on December 5th, 1941. It's absolutely, minus the, the little outline of where one of the trenches is, it's completely the same. Um, and if you go into the, if you walk into the woods a little distance on either side, you can see where the ground is, is very sort of undulating because there are other trenches and other killing sites that are not marked. Right? Um, so I just wanted to point that out because I think um, it's something that we all should know about. So let me ask the question, can anybody hazard a guess why maybe you don't know about this already? Yeah? Because much less people were killed this way than by Auschwitz. Okay, so there are fewer fewer people, right, which also means fewer witnesses. Yeah? You want to make sure to keep it secretive and then, like, so no one will know what they're doing to start, like, the Americans to come in and stop it, but then they're not sure. Yes, this is true also. Um, and in fact, they go so far as to, in 1944, they start trying to go back and find all of these places, dig up the bodies, burn them, um, to conceal the evidence, right? They, could, they did a good job not letting anyone live. Right, so another part of this is that there are much, many fewer uh, survivors. So, for example, we know of at least 80,000 people who survived Auschwitz. Um, there are much, many fewer who survived this because it was very close, it was very up close and personal, um, and that sort of thing. Okay, one more. There's also more, like, the, the culture comes they talking about very that here it was much, they just did it. Here, here it is sort of documented, but you're right, it's, it's less documented than it is elsewhere. Um, another reason is it takes place where? Um, near where the Soviet Union is. Right, and so, what was our attitude towards the Soviet Union in, like, the 50s? Not good, right? They're, they're the enemy, right? During the Cold War, they're the enemy. So there's a reluctance for us uh, as Americans and as Canadians to sort of be interested in any kind of suffering that takes place in the Soviet Union, right? That's really not. They're the bad guys, right? So they can't be the victims. Um, not to mention the fact that the Soviets themselves often try to lump all of the Jewish victims of the Holocaust in with all of the other victims of the Nazis in the Soviet Union, and there were quite a few of them. Um, you know, there were 3 million non-Jewish Poles killed. There were somewhere in the neighborhood of 12 million Soviet civilians, non-Jewish Soviet civilians that were killed. But what the, the Soviets do is take the Jewish peace out of it and say that everyone that was killed were peace-loving communist citizens, which sort of obviates and removes um, any mention of Jews. And you can see this on the monuments. The monuments, in, even in these places, sort of say, you know, 10,000 peace-loving communists and citizens were murdered by the fascist occupiers. Um, so that's another reason why, why we may not know so much about it. Um, in addition, remember how many people are in the Baranoct at any one point? It's called instant check whether I'm, whether I'm getting through. How many people? 17 million. Okay? That's a lot of fathers, brothers, uncles, sons coming back after the war. Okay? So if you start to say that this, this organization is involved in the Holocaust, you're hitting quite close to home for a lot more people. So a lot more people are less likely to be interested in hearing about it. Okay? All right. Um, so why is this important still today? Well, why am I doing this? Because this book is over. I'm working on a new book. Um, how many people expected in this presentation to see Facebook? Anybody? Sweet. All right, here's Facebook. So one of the things I'm doing uh, for another project at some point down the road is I'm going to write a book about these people who choose to reenact, become reenactors of German units, um, and then fight these mock battles, right? Just like the Civil War, the American Civil War, right? There are groups of people who choose to be the Germans, um, which I, I really just I don't understand. So what I want to do is write this book trying to figure this out. Um, and so what I do is I'm on Facebook, just like you guys, believe it or not. I know I'm old, but I'm not that old, right? Um, 
And so one of the things that I do is I join these groups on Facebook of these reenactor groups. And I just kind of watch. I, I troll, right? I, work. I, don't, I don't say anything, right? I just sort of see what people post, right? And so this is somebody who posted this message. Can anybody read that? Or do I need to read it out? OK, good. Um, so this guy says he's going to join this 303rd Police Battalion unit and reenact this unit. I mean, he's going to dress up like them. And he says, uh, you know, you never see a police unit, right? And I, you know, like I said, I haven't talked to him, but it makes you wonder because this police battalion 303 was involved in uh, Baba Yar. How many people have heard of Baba Yar? Okay, Baba Yar was the largest open air shooting of the war. 33,000 Jews from Kiev were murdered, and this police battalion was one of the shooting units. Right. So, why do we need to know about the German army? Because of people like this. Okay. Because maybe, if I'm an optimist, he doesn't know anything about this. Um, and if I'm not, then we have other problems that we have to deal with. Right? Um, so this is my next, next book. After the next um, let's talk about how the German army becomes involved in the Holocaust. Because um, it's not their job, at least initially. Right? What's the job of the German army? To defend Germany, is a nice way of putting it, or to fight the war, right? Um, that's what all militaries, their job is to fight the war, which is to fight who? Everyone else. Everyone else. Hopefully not everyone else. That makes it very difficult, right? Yeah. People don't want to conquer. They want to be control. Absolutely, right? But, they're, but who are they fighting in specific? Who are they supposed to be fighting? They're like Slavic people. Soldiers, right? They're supposed to be fighting other armies. That's what armies do. Right? We all dress up in our various uniforms, and we fight each other. We don't fight civilians, we don't kill civilians, we fight against other militaries who are abiding by sort of the same laws of war that we are. Right? Um, and remember I said at the beginning the Nazis aren't going to do this in the Soviet Union. So how does the German army then shift from that into the Holocaust? One of the ways they do this is what I call the Jew-Bolshevik partisan calculus. Right? And don't worry, there's no math here, it's very simple. For a long period of time, there is an anti-Semitic trope that Jews are behind communism, right? Um, and this comes from the very specious argument that many of the founders of communism were Jewish, which is not quite true, because um, there are some who are prominent, people like Trotsky, who was Jewish, but he never would have identified himself as Jewish. He didn't go to synagogue, he didn't believe in Judaism, um, he was only Jewish because his parents were, right? Uh, and in fact, communism rejects all religions, anyway. But if you're anti-Semitic and you want to believe that communism is behind, or the Jews are behind communism, it's easy to make this argument, which they do. Um, and you can see that right here, this image, right? Um, let's see if I have a... Who is this? Red Army. Army. So this is a regular Red Army soldier, right? Normal guy. Who's this? Anybody know? Um, this is a commissar, right? So kind of like a political boss. And so his job is to keep the, the, the Soviet soldiers in line. Right? Who is this? Stalin. Stalin. Okay, our buddy Stalin. Right? Pretty obvious. He's got his, his nice little mustache. But then who's this? The Jews. Jews, right? So it's pretty obvious, right? This is a leaflet that is dropped on the Soviet soldiers to try to get them to uh, turn, turn themselves into the Germans. Right? Um, it's pretty obvious here. We have this very stereotypical image of a Jew who is literally pulling the strings of this whole war, right? And this is what's being fed to the German army. And, and why this? Um, many Germans in the interwar period after World War I have experienced real sort of fear of communism. In fact, parts of Germany are taken over by communists for a certain period of time. And there's open warfare in the street between these, these rival gangs. Basically, you have these right-wing fascist gangs and these left-wing uh, communist gangs that are fighting in the street and killing each other. And everyone in Europe is deathly afraid of, of communism as a way of sort of destroying every, their entire way of life. Right? So if we make the argument, and I think we can make the argument, that not every German soldier was sort of a raging anti-Semite, most of them were very much raging anti-communists um, and were deathly afraid of communism. And what happens then is 
that at a conference that takes place in the town of Mogilev, um, which is in Belarus, there's a conference that takes place, German officers are invited to it, and at this conference the argument is made that the partisans, and who's what's a partisan? Anybody know? Yeah. Yeah, freedom fighter, guerrilla, um, insurgent, whatever you want to call them, right? They're the, they're the Bielski brothers, people fighting behind the lines, this kind of thing. And so at this conference, the argument is made that, um, that uh, they're all Jewish, okay? which is not true, right? but this is the argument that's made. So the argument is, who's behind Bolshevism? Jews. Jews? Not really, but yeah, that is the argument. Um, who are the partisans? Jews. 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 Who are the Bolsheviks? Jews. Jews. Jews, right? So put these things together. Uh, all Jews are Bolsheviks. All Bolsheviks are partisans. Therefore, all, all, all partisans are Jews. And you can do that in any sort of twisted logic you want, right? But the argument is there. Um, and in this case, you then make an entire group of people into a military target. Now, not, it's not a legitimate military target, but it's a military target. Um, one of the speakers at this conference was a man named Arthur Neba, who was the commander of Einsatz Group of B, and we know now the Einsatz Group and Army's mobile killing squad. Um, and he gives a, ta a presentation on the Jewish question with regard to the anti-partisan war, which isn't taking place at this time. There is no anti-partisan war. Right? What's the Jewish question? It, it, it's what, what to do, from the Nazi perspective. Yeah, from the Nazi perspective. I, mean, I should be clear, there is no Jewish question. I mean, there are lots of Jewish questions, but not the Jewish question, right? Um, but for the Nazis, the Jewish question is, what do we do with the Jews in Europe, right? And by this point, the Nazis are coming to the conclusion that they're going to kill them, right? So these officers go out, and they basically go on a field trip, and they watch a sample operation. Um, during which they don't catch any partisans, but they do catch some Jews. And this is the report, right, that comes from um, this, this exercise. And so the message that these German soldiers and officers take away from this conference is that whenever we find a Jew, we're going to kill them, no matter what. Um, and this coincides with a very important moment in the Holocaust, in the summer and fall of 1941. And this is the moment I argue, and historians will argue about different things, but this is one of the things we argue about. But I make the argument that this is when the Nazis have decided to murder all the Jews in Europe. Because what we see is, remember who was first being killed by the Einsatzgruppen, right? Uh, Jewish men of military age. Now we start to see all Jews being killed, no matter how old you are, whether you're a man or woman or child, right? Uh, which causes problems for the German army, or for the Einsatzgruppen, because there's only 3,000 of them. 3,000 guys who are now responsible for murdering millions of people, right? They simply cannot do it. They, they're just not able to. However, the German army is because they're out and they're all over the place. So my argument is that this, this is how they get involved, right? Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about what this looks like. Um, how are people involved? Um, they, let's see, which was next? What's my next slide? Yeah, let's do this one. Um, the German army gets involved in just about every aspect of a killing. Okay? And that, that goes from rounding up Jews and pulling them out of their houses. They surround the town early in the morning. They pull the Jews out of their houses. They guard them in the marketplace. Um, they march them to the killing site. Um, at the killing site, they guard a group of Jews before they are taken in, group, in smaller groups to the actual shooting trench. They will then guard the shooting trench itself. And um, very often, or sometimes, they will participate in the actual shooting themselves. Okay? So they become very, very deeply complicit, very, very quickly in this sort of thing. Um, and I should note that, and I'll go back to this other slide, um, we can kind of understand, again, this isn't excuse or sympathize, we can understand how in the context of a military operation, people feel coerced into doing something, right? Like if your teacher tells you to do something, 
there's a certain level of authority there, right? That you're going to sort of potentially obey that person, right? Um, which is not to excuse anything, but there, that's the environment. However, what I found is there's a lot of other ways in which the German army got involved that was completely voluntary, one of which is looting, okay? Um, and by the way, this is my, um, the more things change, the more they stay the same picture, okay? Anybody notice any similarities here? Yeah. Yeah, this is the same building. This is the absolutely the same building. So in 1941, it's one of, this is the Ortskommandantur, this is the German Army headquarters, and in 2009, it's the police station. Right? Same building, absolutely the same building. Um, that's just an aside. German soldiers end up looting uh, the dead. They steal rings, watches, clothing. Um, that's pretty disturbing, right? Um, who's ordering them to do this? Was it like a Nobody. Nobody. There's no orders to, to rob the dead. Okay? This is not, does not fall, it's totally voluntary. If you want to, you can, but you don't have to. Anybody have any idea what they do with this stuff? Yeah. I know they collected a lot of Jewish things, like a lot of Jews that were sent to the concentration camp, they go deep, they would like take them all out, and they would like just stockpile everything, all the Jewish items and material. This is absolutely correct. Um, and in, these, in, the, in the Holocaust by bullets, this happens to a lesser extent. Um, so cash and things like that do get collected by the SS killing squad. But the rest of the stuff is sort of left there, right? Um, these German soldiers send it home to their families from the local post office. So they send home children's clothes and shoes and coats to their own families, right? And this is really creepy. Um, and it also sort of indicates a different level of acceptance for what's going on. Right? Because they don't have to do this. Um, they also take advantage of Jewish women um, as a result of this. And there are orders expressly against this. <laughs> You're not supposed to have any contact with Jewish women. Right? Um, it's totally against the rules, and yet they do it anyway. Right? Was there a guess what happened to him? Okay. One, one option is he got shot. He got court-martialed. He got attacked, like fired. He got fired. He got sent to a different post. He got sent to a different post. This is kind of funny because he's already in Russia, which is the worst place he could be. So, <laughs> so at this point, they can't like send him anywhere else. He's already stuck, right? The answer is none of the above. Nothing happened to him. Well, one thing happened to him. He was made fun of. Sad face, right? Uh, people call him names. You can imagine they question his masculinity. They said he was a wuss. Things like this. But that's about it. Nothing else happened. And as far as we know, none of the Jews in the area that he's responsible for were murdered. As a result, he was in charge. Okay? Um, and the last guy I want to talk about um, is a guy named uh, Joseph, uh, Joachim Lockbeeler, who's not on the slide, but the, the brewery is. And Lockbeeler, German soldier, um, before the war, he had a great job. He worked in a brewery. Right? Uh, he was a brewery engineer. That was his profession. He ran a brewery. He made beer for a living. Right? That's pretty good. It's pretty good job. So then he gets drafted into the German army and gets sent to Russia. Not so, not so much fun. But in the small town of Lida, which is in Belarus, near Sloan, and some other places, um, there were two breweries, one of which got destroyed by the Germans as they were coming in, but one of which was operational. And this was the Pupko brewery. And it was owned by the Pupko family, who I had. I actually met relatives of last night in my last talk, which is kind of mind-blowing. Um, it had always been owned by the Pupkos. It was, it was famous for its beard throughout Belarus. Um, Jewish-owned. It's been the family for you know, decades. And Lockbeeler, because he's a brewery, brewery engineer, gets put in charge of this brewery. Right? Now, why is he put in charge of this brewery? To make beer. Why does he need to make beer? the soldiers, right? So in the German army, they get beer, right? Um, and he has to supply that beer. Uh, but he does some very interesting things in this brewery. First of all, he takes the Pukos, the Jewish family that owned it, and <coughs> allows them to continue to work there and to live there, rather than in a ghetto, which is a good thing. He then um, allows them to bring in their families, to include old people and children, right? 
who aren't working in the brewery, right? Old people and children are not workers in the brewery. Um, but he lets them live there anyway. He takes more than he needs. He lets them live there. He allows them to celebrate the Seder. Um, he encourages them, in fact, to celebrate um, Rosh Hashanah and various other Jewish holidays, which is very, very bizarre, at least from a, from a German social perspective. And then finally, um, on the night of one of the major axioms, one of the major roundups, he goes to uh, one of the children working there, um, Michael Stoll, who lives in New York. Um, and I think I have a picture of his family or something. So there they are. This is the Stolovici family. He changed his name to Stolo. He goes to Michael and he says, Michael, go wake everybody up in the brewery and tell them to hide because tonight we are killing off the ghetto. But don't worry, I will protect you. Right? And then he and another one of his German army buddies put their helmets on, grab their rifles, and they go stand out front of the brewery. And when the SS come by, they say, uh, you know, either nobody's in here or they're protected because they're working for the German army. Leave them alone. And a lot of this testimony about this whole situation, because if I had read this just from the German, my, my cynical light would start cutting off, right? Like, this guy's this guy doing the I'm not anti-Semitic, I have a Jewish friend thing, right? Um, but in this case, um, his, he's corroborated by the Putkos, who give testimony in the show archive, who describe this place as an oasis, who then go to the camp, the camp in which he's imprisoned after the war and testify for him, get him out, because he saved them. Now, why am I closing on this? It's not to close on a happy note, okay? Um, let me be clear. What they did, these two men, is statistically insignificant, okay? They saved people, that's great. They made great choices. But in terms of the Holocaust writ large, the six million, um, it was nothing. It was a drop in the bucket. But why is this important? Somebody tell me why this is important. Yeah? It shows that not all of the German soldiers have the same views. Absolutely. So number one, they show they don't have the same views. Everyone has their own Holocaust? Everyone has their own Holocaust. Okay, that's great. So the, this, this experience is different than somebody else. So they showed that they could stand up and not get uh, executed or anything. Bingo. Okay. This is vitally important because it shows that if you want to, even in the context of the Holocaust in Eastern Europe, even in the context of being part of the German army, if you want to save Jews or help Jews or do anything to sort of undermine the German project, you can do that. And you can get away with it. How many, does anybody know how many people, how many Germans were shot for refusing to shoot Jews? None. None. Zero. Zero, okay? Nobody. And, and this is something that historians have been looking for, German defense attorneys for a long time are looking for, right? Because for them, this is the holy grail. If they can find the one instance where a German was shot for refusing to shoot, then everybody else who claims that the reason I did what I did in Auschwitz or anywhere else was because I was going to be shot, all of a sudden becomes a defense, right? Never happens. Okay. All right, um, I'm going to stop here, um, and I think we'll probably be able to talk about, you know, larger reasons why this is important um, in, in our day-to-day in our -day lives, perhaps in the question and answer period. And I, I really want to be in hearing what you guys have to say. So, please, questions, comments, complaints. Don't be afraid. Yeah. Still, certain social pressures. Okay, they wouldn't have been shot for not shooting a Jew, but can you entirely blame it on them? Yeah. Um, this is a great question. Um, from a from a sort of empirical standpoint, yes, because they did it. But that's a really easy question, easy, too simple answer, right? How many people here have experienced peer pressure? If you don't all raise your hands, you're lying. <laughs> In fact, now you're all experiencing peer pressure right now, <laughs> right? Um, how hard is it to stand up against peer pressure? It's really hard, right? You want to be cool, right? You want your friends to like you, um, this sort of thing, right? So you're 100% correct that there are lots of reasons, and very strong reasons why 
ordinary people participate in the Holocaust, right? Because most of the people that participate are not crazy, okay? They're not psychopaths. They're not psychologically criminally insane. They're normal people. So what's really scary about the Holocaust, in a lot of ways, is that these men and others end up murdering naked women and children because they don't want to look bad in the eyes of their buddies. Right? Um, to the extent that after the war, and even during the war, a lot of times the way they excuse themselves from this killing process is by saying, I'm too weak. I don't have the stomach for this. I have children at home, right? So I, I can't kill these children because I have children at home. I'm just a nice guy, right? Um, and that's good for them because it allows them to rejoin the group afterwards, right? Because their fellow soldiers can just say, well, Dr. Warren is just a really nice guy. He's got kids. We can understand why he didn't do this, right? Versus the alternative, which would be to say what? It's wrong. What you're doing is wrong. You should not be doing this. You're all reprehensible. I can't believe you're killing women and children. Now, it's very difficult then to go back and have a beer with those guys afterwards, right? So it's a great point that social psychological pressures are very key to why people are participating. And they're very, very strong, right? And you know this in your lives already. What else? Yeah? Yeah, so this is a great question about propaganda. Yes, so the question is about propaganda. Now, didn't the Germans put out propaganda, and doesn't this affect um, what they believe or how they behave, right? Um, and the answer is yes, of course. Um, the Germans are all about propaganda. The Nazis are all about propaganda, right? And there's all different kinds. And I just showed you one, right? Even though that leaflet was designed for Soviet troops, it gets picked up by everybody else. And there's a whole series of books, little sort of comic booky things that are given to German soldiers about why we fight and against Jews and this sort of thing. Um, one of the problems with propaganda is how do we know whether or not you actually buy into it? So I can stand up here and say that, you know, um, I can think of an example. In Canada, so let's go with hockey. I can stand up here and say the Dallas Stars are the best hockey team in the world. Which is not true at all. <laughs> They're my favorite team. Uh, you know? But I can say it. I can make you sit here for three hours while I just hammer it into you. And some of you might buy it. And some of you might not. And I don't have any way of knowing. Right? So propaganda certainly is very important. Um, and it certainly does change people's minds. Particularly when they see things that reinforce what they've been told. Let me give you an example of that. There's an exhibition that takes place in Germany um, right after the beginning of the war on the Eastern Front. And basically what it does, in a nutshell, is it shows what is life like in, Soviet, in the Soviet Union. And it shows the worst of the worst. Right? People living in huts with pigs and things like this. And on the other side of the page are nice, clean German houses. Right? And on this side of the page are these um, ultra-Orthodox Jews, right, who look very foreign to, uh, to a German, right, um, um, with the side locks and, and everything that they're wearing. And, and of course, then they're living in these peasant communities, right? And the other side of the page is your stereotypical blonde, blue-eyed German family, right? And the implication is very, it's not an implication, it's written there, you know, like, this is culture and this is degenerate race. So then, what happens when you show up in the Soviet Union? And you see that there actually are Orthodox Jews there. They look just like the pictures that I've seen. Right? Um, in, that, in that case, I would say the propaganda can have a real big impact because it's reinforcing something that is false, but that you have sort of been preconditioned to, to believe. I'm getting the... I'm oh, sorry, I was doing it. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> one, one more question? Or yeah. yeah. One more question. Right here. Um, you said there were... 17 million of Germans that were in the army. Mm -hmm. Does that include like people who helped or gathered up, like people who were in the army but still helped the Nazis? The 17 million are just uniform members of the army. 
Um, there are many, many millions more uh, civilians, for example, who go to, the, to these, these same places that I'm talking about, um, basically become like mayors of these towns who are Nazi party members. So there's a whole group of people that surround the German army as well, right, who help them. Um, the 17 million is just uniform members of the German army, to include women. There are women who are in the army um, and are participating in this kind of stuff in different ways as well. Okay, um, I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, Professor Jones.